Whoa. Friday, Gary Coleman is Dwight Cloudclimber, Deadwood Dick, and Alabama Smith. He's the kid with a supercharged imagination in the fantastic world of D.C. Collins, Friday. This is NBC News Digest. Here is Chuck Scarborough, NBC News. Good evening. The Space Shuttle astronauts took another one of those free-flying spacewalks today and also rescued a piece of equipment that almost drifted away. A docking event, though, was canceled when the robot arm on the shuttle malfunctioned. The U.S. Information Agency today admitted to a blacklist of prominent people but said it was not official and it was stopped when it was discovered. A longshoreman strike shut down the ports of Boston and Baltimore today and slowed operations in Philadelphia and Wilmington. Workers in 36 other East and Gulf Coast ports kept on working. And a tentative settlement has been reached today in a bitter 16-week strike against the Douglas Aircraft Company in California. I'm Chuck Scarborough in New York. More news later on this NBC station. At Dominic, save on Norbeth Tender Time Turkey. This is a CBS News special report. After and drop off. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. Good evening. A new day's sun has risen over the onion domes of ancient Moscow, the capital of all the Soviets. When word of the death of Yuri Andropov came almost a full day ago, Moscow, for the second time in 15 months, transformed itself into a city of mourning. The power brokers behind the Kremlin walls putting into gear once again the machinery of succession. Word of Andropov's death at the age of 69 was not a great surprise. He had been very ill and had been out of the public view for six months, but he was the country's leader and he did command respect. Perhaps more than a sense of real loss by the Soviet people, there was a feeling of trepidation about the future, about what the post and drop off Kremlin will be like. It was a feeling that must have swept the country on that cold day 15 months ago, when, as Morton Dean reports, the same question was being asked about the man who followed Brezhnev. Yuri Andropov, somber, severe. An intense gaze behind thick glasses. The air of a scholar. The reputation of a pragmatic strategist. A man of contradictions. An enigma. The Western world had its first good look at its new adversary in that cold November of 1982 at the state mourning for the man he had succeeded, Leonid Brezhnev. It had become clear barely two days after Brezhnev's death that Yuri Andropov had inherited the mantle of power. It was soon to become clear that he also had inherited the problems, problems that came to overwhelm him just as they did his predecessor. Andropov's takeover was a display of unprecedented efficiency. What cemented his power was a carefully nurtured alliance with the Soviet military, with Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov, who believed that Brezhnev's grip had weakened in his final years, and its thought with Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. With Andropov in charge, these men believed the Soviet Union would be strong. Andropov signaled his adherence to this belief in a speech just before being elected Communist Party General Secretary. There was no overture to the West in this speech. There was no specific mention of detente and disarmament. There was an emphasis on the Soviet need to meet foreign threats with force. Peace, said Andropov, can only be defended by relying on the invincible might of the Soviet armed forces. And with that, he was nominated by his chief rival, Konstantin Chernyenko, who quickly realized that while he may have been Brezhnev's hand-picked successor, he did not have the muscle to deny the top party post to Andropov. Seven months later, Andropov was named head of state by the Supreme Soviet, the National Parliament, achieving a consolidation of power it had taken Brezhnev 13 years to attain. At home, Andropov and his colleagues were saddled with a moribund Soviet economy, a system that failed to answer the demands of the people. Andropov displayed a knack for public relations, going to a factory to meet with workers to hear their complaints. There seemed to be some genuine improvement in public morale during Andropov's early days in power. But as labor productivity rose, so did the amount of consumer goods, but not nearly enough. But Andropov's biggest problem was the United States. Let us be aware that while they preached the supremacy of the state, 
declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. In an interview with a West German magazine, his first with Western journalists since taking control, and Dropoff painted a picture of a power-hungry America. He followed this two days later with a letter to Samantha Smith, a 10-year-old from Manchester, Maine, who had written to him. He promised her that the Soviet Union will never but never be the first to use nuclear weapons against any country. Although Samantha would visit the Soviet Union shortly afterward at Andropov's invitation, the Soviet leader did not meet with her. He did meet some weeks later in mid-August with a group of visiting U.S. senators. They said he looked well and spoke with vigor. It was the last time Andropov was seen in public. So this was Yuri Andropov, the politician, the spy master, the man who rarely smiled the consummate calculator, the man who thirsted for power, the man who finally gained it. Kremlin power is about to be passed once again. The foremost question is, who will grab it? In a logic that is pure Russian, the contest is not confined to ideology. It also involves age, the old guard versus the new guard. And as Don McNeil tells us, the old guard appears to have won, at least for now. There is disarray, murkiness, and a lack of cohesiveness in the Soviet leadership as it struggles with the problem of choosing a successor to Yuri Andropov. Will the power group, supported by the military and the secret police, the KGB, which placed Andropov on top, continue to hold together to pick a replacement? If the disarray is widespread, 71-year-old Konstantin Chernyenko, Andropov's main rival for the leadership, could try for it again. His chances were thought to be slim. But now that he has been named head of Andropov's funeral committee, that judgment has to be revised. In the past, the head of the funeral committee has gone on to become the new general secretary of the party. 74-year-old Dmitry Ostinov has to be considered a frontrunner if the original Andropov group sticks together and if they decide to choose from among the older men. Ustinov is nominally a marshal of the Soviet Union, but not a professional soldier, so his appointment could not be construed as a military takeover. He could be counted on to continue the Andropov approach to foreign and domestic policy. A compromise choice for interim leader could be 68-year-old Viktor Grishin. He is the Moscow party boss and a rather gray figure. Although it's believed he supported Andropov in the Brezhnev succession struggle, Grishin is viewed as neutral enough to satisfy party, military, and KGB factions for a short period while long-term choices are sorted out. Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko, 74 years old, is not considered to be a candidate himself, but it's believed he will play a very important role in making the choice. He could be the kingmaker. There is considerable pressure on the Politburo to try and make the succession appear as smooth as the Andropov ascendancy in the eyes of the world. Their main concern must be whether or not to go for a long-term solution now and choose a younger man. Otherwise, they could face a similar situation in the near future. As for relations with the United States, regardless of the choice for new leader, it's believed the Soviets will continue an aggressive, probing foreign policy with their usual stress on military capacity. Siding with his diplomatic advisors against his political advisors, President Reagan will not go to the Andropov funeral in Moscow. Mr. Reagan does not want to send what is being called the wrong kind of message. But he will send a message with Vice President Bush departing tonight to head the American delegation to the funeral. That Reagan message going with Bush is, I am ready to meet at the summit with the man who succeeds and drop off, and no guarantees of substance are needed. Whoever assumes power will be confronted with massive problems. The economy, Afghanistan, Poland, the Middle East, and as Bob Simon reports, perhaps the most difficult of all, relations with the United States. New leaders are coming to power in the Soviet Union. If they act in a responsible fashion, they will meet a ready and positive response in the West. That was President Reagan on his return to the White House after signing the Book of Condolences at the Soviet Embassy. That was November 13, 1982. Leonid Brezhnev was dead. George Shultz signed the Book of Condolences this time, and he too spoke of new opportunities. We remain ready for a constructive and realistic dialogue with the Soviet Union. 
But the Soviets have come to believe that in these American gestures, there's a lot less than meets the eye. They point out that Ronald Reagan is the first American president since Herbert Hoover not to meet with Soviet leaders. The Soviets insist they only walked out of the arms talks in Geneva after they'd concluded it was impossible to deal with a Reagan administration. No matter what happens in Moscow over the next few weeks, many American students of the Kremlin believe the next move will have to come from Washington. I think it is a moment to try to renew the dialogue. I'm not certain the Soviets will accept but it seems to me that it behooves the United States to take the initiative. If there is hope this evening that U.S.-Soviet relations might get better, one reason is that they could hardly get worse. It often seemed this past year that Mr. Reagan and Mr. Andropov were playing a game called Who's the Toughest Guy in Town? They shouted at each other, but neither one ever reached for his gun. Unlike 1948 in Berlin, unlike 1962 in Cuba, nowhere in the world today is there any prospect of direct military conflict between the two superpowers. If there is hope this evening, hope for renewed arms talks, it might be due to Moscow's judgment that it can get a better deal from a president who is running for re-election than from one who's been returned to office for another four years. They are practical people in this sense. If they're going to have to deal with this guy for another four years, they're not going to continue to behave in a way which is going to make him mad and, and, and uncooperative. That seems to be a consensus today among scholars in Moscow and in Washington that the future of U.S.-Soviet relations will depend a lot more on what happens in American politics this year than on the name of the man who will succeed Yuri Andropov. This is Bob Simon at the State Department. With me now are three of my other CBS News colleagues, Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer here in New York, White House correspondent Leslie Stahl in California, where President Reagan is vacationing, and our until recently Moscow correspondent Don McNeil, who has just been reassigned and is now based in Tel Aviv. Bob Schieffer, what is the future of U.S.-Soviet relations, do you think? What's it likely to be in the wake of Andropov's death? Dan, I think in the short run it's going to be very like relations are right now. I, I think we're in a very dangerous period, a very tough period, a time when relations are or perhaps as, as, as tense as they have been since the Cold War, it seems to me that uh, we may continue on into a period like that. Because after all, this is, a, this is a country, the Soviet Union, that is having a very difficult time becoming a part of the 20th century. They have enormous problems at home. Uh, they have not sorted out, it seems to me, exactly what they want to be and where they want to be uh, in world affairs. The leadership question now is, is quite uncertain. We may have Chernyenko, uh, this caretaker uh, who has now been appointed to, to be the man in charge of the, the funeral takeover as, uh, as the head of the Soviet Union. It may well be that we'll be going through all this again in a very short time because this man, after all, is, is a man in his middle 70s. Well, Leslie Stoll, all of this will be uh, played against the backdrop of the American presidential election campaign. Well, that's true, Dan, and uh, I'm having a little trouble with my ear right now. The, uh, this will be played against that, and as uh, we reported tonight on the evening news, the president uh, hopes at least to propose a summit meeting in two or three months, which will be springtime. If the Soviets agree to such a summit, President Reagan could be meeting with the new Soviet leader uh, in the middle of the campaign, and uh, if he can uh, achieve an easing of tensions at that time, that would be a big plus for his prospects for re-election. Well, Don McNeil, uh, how will Soviet policy be affected by the American political campaign? Is uh, a summit meeting now likely? Uh, Dan, it's hard to say. I really think this is turning on the choice of who is elected leader. I disagree with Bob a, a bit here, Bob Schieffer. Well, unfortunately, we've uh, lost Don McNeil in Tel Aviv, and uh, as best I can figure out, we've also lost Leslie Stahl in California. Not because he disagreed <laughs> with me, we should point that out. But, <laughs> but Leslie at least is back. But, uh, Bob, uh, what's your best assessment? Is there likely to be a summit meeting now? Well, there may. Uh, I, I think we'll have to find out if the Soviets want to have one. Just because President Reagan proposes one uh, is certainly no guarantee that, that the Soviets would be in any way interested in having one at this time. They have many, many problems at home to resolve. It may not be uh, in their view and in their interest at this time to meet with the president. So we really don't know who's going to be in charge of the Soviet Union yet. I think it's too soon to say whether they'd really be in the, in the mood to have a summit meeting. Don McNeil, if you're still uh, reading us now, uh, uh, we lost you in almost in mid-sentence. Is it your uh, uh, assessment that there may indeed be a summit meeting this year? 
Uh, as I was saying, Dan, it depends, I think, on who they choose. And if it's a man like Chernyenko, there could possibly be a summit meeting or one of the older generation. I think the most worrisome, worrisome thing for the United States is if a man like Grigory Romanov is chosen as a new general secretary. This man is a Russian nationalist, and he represents a whole growing number of people there who are more nationalistic than they are communist. And I think that they will be a lot tougher than the older generation. Leslie, we have only a few seconds remaining. Uh, uh, in your judgment, is there likely to be a summit meeting, or is this just a case of the president and his campaign advisors seeing an opportunity to get a headline about a possible summit? Well, of course, he has a great advantage in just proposing one. If the Soviets say no, his offer is out there, and that ends up being an advantage for him. Uh, the administration right now says the Soviets are in a period of introspection. They don't expect a change in relations right away, and uh, they really don't know how the Soviets will react to this proposal. Thank you very much, Leslie Stahl, Don McNeil, and Bob Schieffer. The party the office was throwing for the personal computer was getting a little dull. It seemed compatibility was the problem, until one latecomer arrived with a stunning solution, the Sperry PC. It ran all IBM compatible software and communicated with something a lot of people had in common, the main computer, Sperry's, IBM's, or both. The Sperry PC. It's what the personal computer should have been in the first place. Seventy years ago, Whirlpool started with a product and a promise. A promise to build and sell only good quality, honest appliances designed to give you your money's worth and a promise to stand behind them. And to make sure we keep our promise, Whirlpool has a toll-free 24-hour telephone service to help you with problems or questions you might have. Over the years, our Whirlpool appliances have become much more sophisticated, but our promise has never changed. You know, the secret to a comfortable retirement is really no secret. You need a smart investment firm to help you get there. And the best way to find that investment firm is to ask a lot of questions. And Katie and I asked. And the more we asked, the more good things we heard about one company, Dean Whitham. We heard about the quality of their financial advice and programs. We heard they really listen, really care. For us, Dean Whitter was worth asking about. Dean Whitter, worth asking about. We asked the Rockaseys if they thought their denture cleanser could clean away cherry stain. I believe it could. What about cherry and coffee? Maybe. Or a triple stain of cherry, coffee, and even tough tobacco? I don't think it would clean it. Then watch Extra Strength Effortant work on a triple stain of cherry, coffee, and even tough tobacco with Effortant's powerful blue action formula. The stain is gone. It cleaned in between. We are going to switch to Effortant. Extra Strength Effortant removes even stubborn stains between teeth. So far, we've seen how Yuri Andropov's time and power affected relations between Washington and Moscow, and how his death might alter them again. But the Andropov era, brief as it was, also had an impact on a broader scale. Few areas of the globe escaped the tensions it generated, as we see now in this series of reports. This is what Yuri Andropov was waiting and planning for during much of his early months in power. The anti-nuclear, anti-American demonstrations in Western Europe that heralded the arrival of new American missiles and, Andropov hoped, the progressive rot of the ties linking the U.S. with its NATO partners. This image of flexibility in the face of American intransigence was one that Andropov sought to cultivate from his first days in power, a sharp contrast with his predecessor, Leonid Brezhnev. But in many West European capitals, hope quickly gave way to disillusion, anticipation to a frightening sense of déjà vu. Andropov, it seems, was no major break with the past. As with much of Russian history, Andropov's reign was all part of a vast continuum, evolving glacially. The first real indication it was business as usual followed quickly, the sudden and unexpected expulsion of 47 Soviet spies from France and a parade of smaller numbers from a range of other West European capitals. Spy networks set up by Andropov as head of the KGB and whose ever more blatant attempts at penetration of West European high-tech industries showed no signs of abating. 
There was more to come. Soviet concessions at the arms control talks in Geneva appeared less and less sincere, finally leading to a complete breakdown with the Soviets walking out. Are you coming back next week? No, sir. No, no. no, no. no, no. To the end, Andropov continued to insist that French and British missiles be included in NATO totals, though both countries reiterated their total independence. Un, zero, feu. By the time West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl arrived in Moscow, the first visit by a major Western leader to Andropov's Kremlin, the stage was set for a confrontation. Said Kohl to his host, you must understand our determination. Without major concessions, we will deploy American missiles on our territory. There were new questions as well across Western Europe. How firmly in charge was Andropov if a man of his supposed sophistication could allow events to get so out of hand? The early days of promise and hope had all but evaporated. David Andelman, CBS News, Paris. Yuri Andropov's name never became a household word in Poland. Only rarely did his picture even appear in a Polish newspaper. But the ex-KGB chief and master craftsman of silent, efficient state security was an unseen presence in Polish life. During his time in office, Poland moved from a cycle of intermittent violent confrontation to a much more sophisticated kind of police action in which demonstrations are discouraged before they begin. Reflecting on Dropov's methods, there has been a huge increase in the power of Poland's security services and much closer surveillance of dissidents. The country's number one dissident, Lech Wałęsa, told CBS News by telephone from his home in Gdansk, as a Christian, I can only say, give him, O Lord, eternal rest. Said a factory worker, no matter what happens, we are under the Russians' thumb. Unfortunately, that's true and will remain true. The only change Poles dare hope for is that Andropov's successor might improve relations between the Soviet Union and the United States. That could have beneficial effects in Poland. What Poles fear is that someone might come to power in Moscow who would force Polish authorities to impose even more of a crackdown here. John Shea on CBS News, Warsaw. In the Middle East, Andropov's hand could be most clearly felt in Lebanon. Soviet influence is exercised here through a third party, Syria. Andropov re-equipped Hafez al-Assad's army with sophisticated Soviet military hardware. In so doing, he helped make the Syrian leader one of the most powerful figures in the Middle East. Assad, his hand strengthened by the Soviets, has gained a dominant influence in Lebanese affairs. No new government is likely to be formed out of the wreckage of Lebanon without Assad's approval. But even in Lebanon, Soviet meddling has been limited. And Dropov's Middle East policy was cautious. The Soviet Union maintains cordial relations with Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi, but that other great troublemaker of the Middle East, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, remains anti-Soviet. Soviet influence is at its weakest among the leaders of the oil-producing Arab countries, the men who control the real wealth of the Middle East and its most strategic asset. This is Tom Fenton in Beirut. We have interdicted some of the supplies that are going from Nicaragua uh, over to El Salvador. Uh, if you go to the source, uh, I think you're talking about the Soviet Union. Working from that point of view, the Reagan administration has come down hard on Soviet adventurism and Soviet clients in the Caribbean basin. Just four months after Yuri Andropov came to power, President Reagan displayed photos of Soviet military hardware in Nicaragua and Cuba. In response to Soviet moves in the region, the administration has sent Navy ships and planes to show the flag. Joint military maneuvers have been carried out by U.S. and Honduran forces, and more are planned. Millions have been spent arming and training the Contras, who are trying to overthrow the Soviet-supported government of Nicaragua. But it was in Grenada last October that the administration really got the attention of the Soviets. The U.S.-led invasion toppled the leftists who had seized power in the tiny island nation. Hundreds of the Soviet's Cuban clients, who had been turning Grenada into a communist stronghold, were dispatched back to Havana. And a message was sent to Yuri Andropov, Moscow had lost a round in the Caribbean Basin. This is Richard Wagner. In Asia, there will be few mourners for Yuri Andropov. 
He will forever be the symbol of the Soviet regime that ordered the destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007 last September. Korean and Japanese demonstrators left a message at the Soviet embassy in Tokyo then when they tried to cover the embassy sign with one that read, The Murderous Soviets. 269 dead will be Yuri Andropov's legacy here. Andropov continued the Soviet Union's military buildup in the Far East. He deployed more ships here and aimed more missiles at Asian nations. Andropov tried but did little to improve relations with China. The Chinese still want Russian troops away from the Chinese border. They want the Russians to stop supporting the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia and they want the Russians out of Afghanistan. A conflict Andropov did not start, but also did not stop. Andropov's greatest impact might be this, a buildup of the Japanese military. Japan's trust of the Soviet Union went down with the Korean airliner. And now, under pressure from the United States and with popular support, defense spending in Japan is sharply going up. A nation in which few people used to fear an enemy has begun to fear one now. This is Wyatt Andrews in Tokyo. There's nothing different here. I'd say something's very different here. That something is Kellogg's fruitful brand. Fruitful Bran is a high-fiber cereal that's a feast of raisins, dates, apples, and golden honey. Here's fiber made delicious. Discover new Kellogg's Fruitful Bran and make every brand new day more fruitful. It's a tough job making a decision. You need all the facts. They cut their fare. We need numbers. AT&T Information Systems can help with the complete range of products. We can match them. No good. To get you the right information at the right time. Thanks. We're in good shape. So you can do the tough part and do it right. Bill, I've got a better plan. AT&T Information Systems, when you've got to be right. I don't believe it. Believe it. Last year, this very same weekend, it was beautiful. Couldn't you have called first? I didn't know there was going to be such a change. Well, you can't take things for granted. Look at the tax laws. Can't I use last year's return? Not unless you want to make a mistake and delay our refund. What's changed? The deduction for working married couples has doubled, up to $3,000. I'm listening. And we can only deduct our medical expenses if they're over 5% of our adjusted gross income. And there's no separate deduction for a health insurance premium. We're going to need a doctor if this weather doesn't let up. Also, casualty and theft losses have changed. You know, you're pretty smart. Well, I told you not to take things or people for granted. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to clear up. For more information, send for the free IRS publication 553. We've been examining the many ways Yuri Andropov left his imprint on the always fragile balance of East-West relations. Now for some educated guesses on perhaps what happens next, on what the new Soviet leadership might have in mind, with me is Marshall Goldman, a noted authority on Soviet affairs. Professor Goldman, how might the Soviet leadership, the new Soviet leadership, be expected to act, in particular in some of the world trouble spots that we just heard our correspondents speak about? Well, I think I would agree with them that there probably will more, be more continuity than change, uh, simply because a new leadership will probably seek to establish uh, more of a coalition inside the Soviet Union, which means that they have to be very cautious. Uh, they may also seek to, just as Andropov did, give the appearance of of opening, of being a response, of being flexible. So uh, it isn't necessarily a sign that we will have more tension. It's conceivable we could have some flexibility and relaxation. Would you expect to see the Soviets, uh, for example, withdraw from Afghanistan? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'd see anything like that, particularly like somebody like Chernyenko, uh, if he comes to power. I don't think they're going to be that bold. Uh, they may talk, and they may indeed welcome uh, Reagan uh, to come to a summit. Uh, they may not, but, but in any case, I think uh, there's going to be more continuity than any, any kind of rash thing like withdrawal of troops. Well, speaking of President Reagan, he's decided not to go to the funeral. 
What is likely to be the effect of that based on your experience? Well, I think it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake because, as one of your correspondents pointed out, the Russians may not want to have a summit uh, three months down the road, whereas if Reagan went to the, the funeral, they would presumably receive him right away, and you wouldn't have to have the formality of preparing for a summit with all the staff preparation. Uh, so he may be losing an opportunity. It doesn't mean that you go to a, to a funeral and all the world's problems will be resolved, but at least the way Reagan operates on a person-to-person -person basis, he will have established a precedent. That precedent so far does not exist. He has not really met senior Soviet leaders, and, and I think that's a mistake. Of course, he didn't go to the Brezhnev funeral either. No. In the in few seconds we have remaining, what about the effects in, in Eastern Europe, an often overlooked uh, sphere of influence for the Soviet well, Union? Well, it may turn out that the Soviets may have more problems in Eastern Europe than, uh, than we have been anticipating. There have been some peace demonstrations, oddly enough. The Russians have been directing their propaganda to Western Europe, but we've overlooked the fact that the Czechs, the East Germans, and even the Romanians have been calling for uh, a less, uh, insula fewer installation of missiles than, than more. In fact, even the Romanians have called for a nuclear-free zone in that part of Europe. So it, it doesn't mean the missiles won't be installed, but it means that the Russians may find that the East European countries are not as pliant as they should be. Professor, thank you very much. The party the office was throwing for the personal computer was getting a little dull. It seemed compatibility was the problem, until one latecomer arrived with a stunning solution, the Sperry PC. It ran all IBM-compatible software and communicated with something a lot of people had in common, the main computer, Sperry's, IBM's, or both. The Sperry PC. It's what the personal computer should have been in the first place. Denerex Shampoo and Conditioner versus Head and Shoulders, regular formula. This side feels very tingly. It feels like a whole bunch of fingers are in there. And this side feels like shampoo. I don't get that refreshing feeling or anything like that. Look what you used. Denerex. Each shampoo has one medicine for dandruff. Denerex adds an extra anti-itch medicine. And Denerex adds conditioner, too. I didn't have to put any rinse on it. And it felt soft. And it felt silky and manageable. I'm going to switch to Denerex. Denerex. Dandruff shampoo that conditions, too. Like it or not, East and West are also facing each other these days on the hockey rinks and bobsled runs of the Winter Olympics in Yugoslavia. And as we hear now from John Blackstone, while the Soviet athletes may be touched by Andropov's death, it won't deter them from their ultimate goal, victory for the Soviet Union for a way of life. It was just after noon in Sarajevo's snow that the Soviet flag at the Olympic Village was lowered to half-staff. The flag of Yugoslavia was lowered as well. Some athletes learned of the death as they returned to the village after competitions this morning. But for the Soviets, this was not an occasion for public grief. Most wanted to take the news privately. The team held a brief memorial service in a flag-draped room at the Olympic Village, but that too was kept private. The death of their leader does not change the duty of the athletes here. I feel that it's very sad, uh, yeah, sad uh, thing that happened uh, and uh, we are very sorry for it, but uh, our athletes will try to do uh, for the country their job. The Soviets will continue their quest for gold in Sarajevo. Their hockey team was stung by the American victory in Lake Placid four years ago. This year, the team is determined not to lose again. And as usual, the Soviets are rich in other winners. In only two days of competition, they have won two gold medals, one silver and a bronze. Sarajevo is truly one of those cities where East meets West, and never more so than during these Olympics. Some aspects of the political confrontation between East and West may change with the death of Andropov, but the Soviets have traditionally believed that success in sports can demonstrate political superiority, and that is unlikely to change no matter who leads the Soviet Union. This is John Blackstone in Sarajevo. The Soviets are used to leaders who stick around for a long time. Stalin ruled a dozen years, Khrushchev more than half that, Brezhnev 18 years, a whole generation. Now, in the wake of the short reign of Yuri Andropov, there is confusion and the need to get to know a new ruler all over again. This could make for dangerous times. It will make for interesting times as we watch and wait to see what happens after Andropov. For CBS News, Dan Rather in New York. Good night.
After and Drop Off has been a special report from CBS News. This is CBS. The Edge. In name brand sporting goods, the Sportmark Edge. With the biggest selection and professional advice, the Edge. With low prices every day, Sportmark gives you the Edge. The Amrec 610 Precision Rowing Machine. Smooth, easy riding, constant rowing action. Amrec 610. No other machine like it. Padded seats, stainless steel oars, stable on slick floors. Amrec 610 at Sportmark. For sports, it's Sportmark. We think John M. Smith Homemakers has a price policy that beats any. Our everyday prices are so low, we simply can't reduce them. But check for yourself. Check Homemakers' prices against special sale prices at any other store and see if our everyday prices aren't as low or lower. And remember, it's not low price furniture. It's good furniture at low prices. Every day. John M. Smith Homemakers. Five locations, including our newest in Fort City. Channel 2, WBBM-TV, Chicago. Tonight, on the CBS Late Movie, a miraculous super jet rockets towards certain disaster as the whole world watches in horror. George Maharis, Robert Reed, and Doug McClure head an all-star cast. SST, Disaster in the Sky. Maiden one, ready to roll. Nothing could rival their SST on its first flight. Nothing except sabotage. Tina Louise. My God. George Maharis. I don't care. Fire me. Just turn this thing around. Lauren Green. This is not just a promotional event. I hope future rides on that flight. Fame and glory had made them enemies. Could they join forces and save hundreds of lives with seconds left to try? SST. Disaster in the sky. Ignite afterburners. All right, let's take it through Mach 1. Uh, this is Captain Walsh. The airspeed is now approaching 660 miles per hour. Please direct your attention to the macometer window. An empty plane, and he's making announcements? When the number one appears, we will be penetrating the sound barrier. You will observe no unusual vibration or sound within the aircraft. I want to make clear to you, as you will to your passengers, that in exceeding the speed of sound, there is no safety hazard whatsoever. meeting airplanes. Well, when it's a plane like this, it's new. Just like it was news when the network fired you. Now, what have you been doing lately? We haven't heard too much from you. Sorting through offers, mostly. We have a big one about to break. Say, a lot of folks at home would like to know what that is. I'm sorry, Harry. Nothing's firm yet. You'll be the first to know. Nice to see you. 
That was Lyle Kingman.